Super excited for this Mission 43 podcast with Malcolm Brown. He is a Mission 43 Leaders Fellow. He's a graduate of the Entrepreneur Course. And now, through the entrepreneurial spirit, he has started his own for-profit company that does some really amazing work locally called We Lolo. Let's get after it. Yeah! Welcome to the Mission 43 Podcast, a podcast dedicated to discussing the struggles and triumphs of transitioning to life after the military. I'm Dan Nelson. I'm a former Army Special Forces officer who's personally experienced the challenges of transitioning to civilian life. In every episode, we'll be sharing tips, strategies, and real-life stories of veterans and their families who've chosen Idaho for their life after the military. So join us, and let's start the conversation. All right, welcome to the podcast, Malcolm Brown. Appreciate you. You, you being here, man. Yeah, absolutely. Been been uh, looking forward to this day for what about a year and a half now. I think when we first had that conversation at uh, JCAF about potentially getting on podcast. So I'm glad you guys had a chance to take a look at my uh, application and get me through. Well, it's been quite a year for you. You're now currently in cohort four, the Leaders Fellowship, mm-hmm. and you have left your old job and started full time with your new nonprofit, which is We Lolo. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, we Lolo is uh, stands for We Love Local. It's uh, kind of a passion project for me. It. Um, but now you're all in. All in, <laughs> all in, all in. Uh, I think I've been all in the whole time, but yep. I was just trying to figure out how to really make it the, the main thing. Um, but yeah, it's something I've been working on since uh, April, March, April of 2020 was when the idea first was kind of conceived in my mind. And, uh, you know, me having a medical background, I thought it would be pretty easy just to, hey, I got an idea, let's go build a nap. Mm-hmm. But you realize pretty quickly that that's not how it works. I have no idea how to even begin <laughs> building an app. Yeah. But we'll come back to Wee Lolo here and spend enough time on that because it is pretty incredible what you got going. Yeah. But take us back, like, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Yeah, I grew up in uh, the great state of Georgia. Um, well, I don't know, great is uh, a good word, but yeah, I mean, national champs, <laughs> Georgia Bulldogs. Uh, but yeah, I grew up in Georgia, small town. Uh, kind of bounced around uh, a little bit throughout uh, my life in Georgia. Initially, in up in Atlanta, then migrated down South Georgia, small town Albany, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I uh, kind of ended up in a very small town called Eastman, Georgia. It's about an hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes south of Atlanta. That's where the majority of my mom and my dad's family uh, lived. So through life, we just kind of eventually uh, ended up back in that area. But that's where I was um, born and raised and joined the military uh, right out of high school. What made you want to do that? Uh, wasn't a lot of other opportunities uh, for me uh, at that time. I had a good friend that was going into the Air Force, um, and um, my godparents had two sons. One was in the Naval Academy, one was in the Air Force Academy. And they had came home, I think it was the summer prior to my senior year, and they had kind of started to kind of plant the seeds of maybe yeah. joining the military. Uh, I knew I did not want to go to college. I wanted to go to college, but I knew I wasn't ready for college. I yeah. barely got through high school just because I was I was the typical jock, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted to play sports, no school work. I just wanted to do what Malcolm wanted to do. But I had seen enough of um, the environment that I knew that if I did not leave, that I would end up like everyone else, kind of getting stuck there. Mm-hmm nine to five, never leaving. Um, so the options kind of became um, join the military or join the military. Um, <laughs> so you joined the Air Force. Yeah, so yeah, so I joined the Air Force. And I, I think that was a part of me that always, the military was always somewhat of an option. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I was like everyone else. I was a fan of Top Gun. I thought I wanted <laughs> to be the next, I wanted to be the Black Maverick, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh but so, yeah, it, and, and I tell people looking back, I have no regrets. It was probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. Um, I wouldn't have agreed with that doing basic training. I hated basic <laughs> training. <laughs> yep. But it was definitely one of the best decisions I made because it was definitely the springboard I needed. And it gave me some um, it gave me a little bit of a, um, a safe space to grow and mature. Mm-hmm. Right? How long did you spend during that time? In the military, yeah, I was active duty for eleven and eleven years, nine months. Okay, um, got out 
and then I did the reserves about three and a half okay. years. Um, I was planning on finishing up in the reserves, but at the time I was a full-time student. Mm -hmm. And it was difficult to also, because um, my undergrad required a lot of internship hours, so it was always conflicting with my military obligation. Um, and since I had already made the commitment to go to school full-time and kind of go into that next phase of life, I had to make the tough decision to give one of those things up. And it was the, uh, the military in the reserves. And I had always planned on going back once I kind of got situated in my new career. Mm -hmm. But again, that just never happened. What, what changed then? So like your high school experience sounds like it was similar to mine, mm -hmm. where we did everything we possibly could to <laughs> avoid any kind of academic development. Mm -hmm. um, so after your military experience, I guess, if you could put your finger on it, why were you then ready for college? Um, you mean why was I ready for college after the military? Yeah. I, I always wanted to get my college degree uh, because at the time no one in my family had a college education. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think my aunt had went through, got her associates in like uh, nursing, mm -hmm. but no one else had really gone through college. Actually, I take that back. My uncle played football for the University of Georgia in the early 80s. Uh, but other than that, no one, I didn't really have a lot of, like that was not, um, for me it was really important to break cycles, mm -hmm. right? And I wanted to get my college degree. So while I wasn't mentally and probably just lazy. I didn't want to go to college. I was just done with schoolwork. I didn't want to learn. I didn't want to sit in class. Yeah. And um, but for me, I knew I wanted to go to college because again, it was important for me to kind of be that person in my family that was kind of able to get a college degree, go on and have a good life. Right. You can kind of hear that I was kind of prescribing, sub subscribing to this idea that education, getting a good job was a key to happiness and success. Absolutely. Um, so that's was kind of like the next step for me. Did you have a family of your own at this point? No, no, no. Um, I've been a um, I've never been married, um, but but I do obviously have a son. He's 14 um, who lives here with me mm -hmm. in, in Boise. Uh, but no, no family at the time. It was just me. So all my decision making was pretty easy because I didn't have to really think about the ramifications for someone else. It was just me you know, living free and easy. Uh, I was like a college kid, <laughs> literally, man, getting getting paid, traveling the world. And I'm like, what what do you want to do, Malcolm? And I don't know, Malcolm, what do you want to do? And yeah. so I was kind of, you know, you know, kind of living free at that moment. So where'd you go to school and what'd you study? Uh, so my last duty station was in, uh, it was a joint command with the Navy and Army. I was down at Naval Air Station, Jacksonville. Oh. Um, and there was a university there, University of North Florida, fighting ospreys. Oh, really? <laughs> so many I, universities. I put the fighting in there, just ospreys. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds fun, right, when you put oh, yeah. fighting in there. Uh, but I did my undergrad in uh, athletic training, sports medicine. Nice. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, I, I enjoyed athletics and I enjoyed sports. I think like a lot of young men, I thought I was going to be the next, you know, NFL N NBA superstar. Mm -hmm. uh, that dream died fairly quickly. <laughs> <laughs> did you play ball in college? I, I didn't. I did not. I did not. Uh, unfortunately, UNF did not have a football team. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of like a joke that goes around UNF. Like we're undefeated in yep. football. Yep. There you go. <laughs> we're pretty undefeated. Um, but yeah, so I did athletic training, sports medicine, um, and then I eventually uh, went to graduate school at Valdosta State, which oh. is in South Georgia. Yep. And uh, I continued that kind <clears throat> of uh, trek there in, in Valdosta, title town, USA, as we like to call it. And obviously, uh, I have a lot of pride in that. I'll, also, I would like to say ESPN named Valdosta, Georgia, title town, USA. A lot of success up, there. A lot of success there. A lot of people in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Oh, I yeah. spent some time in, in Wisconsin. They like to argue that Green Bay <laughs> is title time. I'm like, so, uh, but yeah. So, in that, so you get your master's and you did your undergrad. You are finished kind of with your military time at this point. Mm -hmm. What brought you to Idaho? Oh, man. Um, so when I left graduate school, I did uh, what they call the athletic training residency program, which is kind of like a an opportunity to 
transition from working with sports teams like on the sideline or in the training room, you transition to more of a clinical setting. Yeah. Uh, and I did that at the University of Wisconsin up in Madison. Okay. Um, really enjoyed my time there. I was there for about a year and a half. Um, and w- as my time was winding down, I was looking for you know full time job and uh, opportunities. And I knew one guy here in in in, in Idaho. He reached out to me. Like, hey, we may have an opportunity here in Boise. You have any interest? I was like, hell no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? Um, and there's a, a ton of reasons and ignorance behind why I said that. But um, long story short, the more and more I looked at the locations that I thought I may want to live, Boise kept coming back up, kept mm-hmm. coming back up, kept coming back up. It checked a lot of the boxes. Yeah when it comes to places I wanted to live. I knew that once I got here, my son would be with me full time. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to find a space where um, I could be a single father and that would be, the, the environment was was accommodating for that. Yeah. And of all the cities that I looked at, uh, Boise was easily the best place to fit that criteria. But there was also a lot of um, reasons why I did not want to move to Idaho or Why? Boise, right? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I grew up in the South, right? Just like people have a, a perception of what things are like in the South. Yep. Uh, and being a single dad, African-American, I didn't know anything. I didn't know enough about Idaho to think that this would be a safe place for me to raise my son. Gotcha. Um, but I also want to live my life uh, without limits in a way, without yep. being told where I can and can't go. Um, so I think once I looked at everything, it just felt right. It did. It really, really felt right to come to to, uh, to Boise, to Idaho. I think I um, I convinced myself that I would give it two years. Right? It was like a short tour in yep. the military. Right? I do two years anywhere. You can go. Then you can go give wherever you want. Right? And I thought that would not look bad on my resume um, if I transitioned after two years. So I think when I uh, considered all of those options, you know. Been here for two years. It's a good job, but it looked good on my resume. Shows a diversity and experience, different locations. Mm-hmm. Like, go do it, Malcolm. Do it for two years, and then you can eventually, um, you know, transition and go wherever you want. Well, uh, I got to ask, with all your preconceptions, I guess, of what life in Idaho could be for you and your son, or mm-hmm. what it would be, both positive or negative, how mm-hmm. did it end up for you? I'm still here. <laughs> How long has it been? <laughs> Six years, actually, next month. Okay. Six years next month. And, uh, you know, I really, really, really enjoy my time here in Boise uh, and in Idaho and this whole Pacific Northwest. I think it's my energy, right? You know, yeah. I, I think if, uh, you know, if, like, this part of the country is kind of like, you know, we have a spirit animal. This is kind of like my spirit <laughs> region, right? I love the mountains. I love the outdoors. I love yeah. the Four Seasons. Uh, and if I'm being honest, people here in Boise have welcomed me and my son with open arms. And that's not just, you know, talking because we're on a podcast. They really yeah. have. And um, it's good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And I tell people that if it wasn't a place where I felt like I can grow, build a community, not just me, but my son as well, sure. I wouldn't still be here. Um, so, yeah, no, all of my and, 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 and I knew that. Right. A lot of those uh ideas I had about how I may be treated or received here in in, uh, Idaho um, were rooted in a ton of ignorance, right? You know, you you don't know what you don't know, right? You know, we we function based off of things we see on TV, the books we read or like whatever, right? The news. Uh, The news, right? right? They tell us the stories that that, that we want to hear and we take it as fact. Um, And and, and I also want to live a life where... um, I can say I experienced things instead of putting limitations on myself. Uh, and also want to be, a, I want to model that for my son and I want to model that for the other young men in my life as well. So being a single father mm-hmm. here in Idaho for six years now, like what is, what is the highlight I think of your experience either just as you as a person or you as a father, you as a family, do you have any highlights in your time here? Um, for me personally, I think honestly, it was doing the uh, uh, 
the uh, wilderness immersion back in September, right? That's my first time sleeping, other than being in the military, uh, sleeping in a tent. This is my first time with a backpack, hiking out somewhere, setting up camp, and spending three days. You're three talking nights. about the Leaders Fellowship yeah, wilderness immersion? Exactly. Yep. Uh, that was pretty cool, like really, really cool. Uh, so much so that I'm looking forward to doing something similar with my son mm-hmm. uh, here coming up when the weather permits. Uh, so that was a kind of a personal highlight for me because it was something that, that I've always wanted to do is to get out in nature and like be out there. But again, I've never experienced that type of environment growing up in the South, right? Yeah. We don't have a lot of, it's pretty flat where I grew yeah. up at, right? Uh, and my family, we didn't do any camping, right? Um, so I, I did not, I, I wanted to have some some reps under my belt before <laughs> I took my son yep. out. Right. Uh, last thing I want to do is be people always tell me like, you know, the chances of you, you know, running up on a bear or a cougar <laughs> or something is like one in two million or whatever. Right. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be that <laughs> one person. Yep. So and plus I wanted to be prepared for it. Um, so definitely looking forward to uh, getting back out there this um, this this summer, uh, getting kind of uh, experience in the outdoors. Uh, as far as an experience with my son and I. Uh, I think just being able to watch him grow mm-hmm. up here and um, like go skiing, mm-hmm. mountain biking, right? There's so many things that I've been able to experience during my time here in, in, in Boise and in Idaho that I didn't really think about, yeah. you know, but be able to share it now with my son has been pretty cool. It's funny how like the <clears throat> the realm of possibility or like the reality that you're living in is what the reality that you perceive to be the extent of the world. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like people that grow up in a rural place, whether it's in Idaho or South Georgia, that's like kind of all they see. You yeah. know, and you know, going to other countries in the military, mm-hmm. you see that all the time. Yeah. People yeah. that are looking, their world is the size of this room. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Or slight exaggeration. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it was, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the uh, the author. I know the quote, it says, uh, travel is the antidote to ignorance, mm-hmm. right? Um it's not Daniel Boone, I want to say Daniel Boone, but basically that was something that was kind of like, it was always in the front of my head. Mm-hmm. And that's something that the military provided uh, for me was the ability to travel. And it started to really break down some of those um, thoughts I had about different cultures and different people, getting a chance to get out um, and it kind of experience life for myself and realizing that no matter where you go, people are people, mm-hmm. right? No matter what the skin looks like, no matter what region of the world, people at the end of the day are just people. Like you have to respect cultural differences and things of that nature, but you know, like being able to get out and experience those things, um, meet different people, uh, eat different foods. I mean, that's yeah. what life should be about, I think. Well. So talking about that, talking about your background and then the unique perspective that you've been able to develop through the military and your own personal choices, whether it's through education or, you know, raising a son, Mm -hmm. what translates into what you're doing now? Because like We Lolo is very unique, like starting Mm -hmm. a nonprofit is is not easy, Yeah, especially one that's app based, I imagine. I've never done it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just one thing real quickly uh, for the whole podcast world, We Lolo is for profit. It's oh, not gotcha. non profit. All right, well, I'm keeping, uh, there you go. No, no, sorry about that. Um, it is for profit, but right now, that's, that's not the focus of it. And uh, the focus of it is to support local communities, support local businesses, and to be to create an avenue for people to be generous and, and to do random acts of kindness. Well, that's why it seems like a nonprofit to me because it's based on, you know, people being generous. Yeah. And yeah. Spreading it on. So I apologize. Yeah. No. So why tell us about the model then? Like for somebody like me that obviously is starting <laughs> from the from the wrong place, what is We Lolo? Yeah. So first off, just because you and I connected on this idea and I give you a little bit of insight into why I decided to make it for profit versus non profit. Mm-hmm. What's more? Yeah. Uh, the work. The you work. and I talked about that the first time it's we a great met. Book. Great book. Uh, the now governor of the state of Maryland, Wes Moore, he talks about in one of his podcasts that the first thing he tells people to do if they think about starting a nonprofit is to not start a nonprofit, <laughs> right? Yep. Finding out what's, what already <laughs> exists. So, because you don't want to dilute this, the, the, the system in the community, right? Yeah. And I thought there was enough 
I ain't said enough. This is Malcolm speaking, all right? I thought there was more than enough nonprofit organizations that focused on these types of things. Yeah. And I think there's a way to do it for profit that makes sense and still feels good yeah. um, to me as well as to the communities that I want to impact with this endeavor. Uh, so, um, yeah, so we little to me, and I'll give you a little bit of a quick, I, I try to make a quick story about how this idea was conceived. I was on a walk. I was kind of breaking the rules during COVID. I was supposed to be like quarantining, isolating inside the house. We've already reported you. <laughs> <laughs> I went for a walk and I was listening to this podcast. Um, and this guy, uh, Ross Gay, he was getting interviewed. And he made, uh, I think the, the, the question was, uh, why they were talking about the media and things of that nature. And he made the comment about, you know, the media would never uh, report about good things that are going on in the world uh, because there's not enough good things going on in the world. Yep. Like, and it doesn't really sell, right? Like, nobody wants to hear about the guy who s- walked the lady across the street or saved the cat from the tree, right? This doesn't make the headlines. And it was like at that moment I started to think about how can we do something, how can I do something that's cool, not to make the news, but that is noteworthy, right? That's worth sharing. And I think it was maybe a day or so later I walked over to a a local coffee shop and I purchased a uh, gift card. I put like 30 bucks on it and I left it at the, I just like, no, leave it here. Whoever comes wants to use it, great. If people want to add to it, great. That's cool. Yeah, I went back like three or four days later, not even thinking much about it. And there was like two or three people in front of me. And at the time they were, uh, you know, selling coffee through like like the drive the drive through window, right? You oh walk yeah, up, yeah, yeah. Right. And the barista was the same young lady, and she literally stopped what she's doing and just just yelled back like, "Hey, I just want to tell you that that gift card you left." You know, it kept going for like two and a half days, That's right? Because awesome. people were using it and then adding more to it. And um, so that was when, for me, I was like, you know what? Maybe I can create something here that will allow us to support the local businesses that we care about, mm-hmm. uh, that will allow us to support community, support each other. And obviously, 2020 was a pretty crazy wild year did something happen uh, i don't <laughs> i heard about it on just the, kidding. <laughs> but it was a time for me where um you know i thought instead of continuing to echo the divide that was going on yeah. in society how can i find a way to connect people to literally bring people to the table right and that's a pretty audacious audacious like goal but I thought sometimes just buying a person a cup of coffee can spark a conversation. Mm-hmm. That conversation can turn into a lifelong friendship, right? Yeah. And local businesses are kind of where we go to find community and we spend a lot of time there. So for me, it just made sense to create something around things that I really cared about and as people in my local community. It's interesting. So how have you found, because I know people have benefited from the generosity of others through We Lolo, mm-hmm. where like, Someone says they want to buy a coffee for a veteran, and I go mm-hmm. into a place and see the Wee Lolo, you know, logo, and mm-hmm. know that I could ask for it. Yeah. Um, but how have you seen that actually spark conversation? Like you're bringing people to local establishments. Mm-hmm. How is Wee Lolo bringing people together to create that vibe that you're ultimately after? Yeah. Um, like, what impact are you hopeful for for Wee Lolo? I want it to be a. Uh, I want We Lolo to be become the vehicle that people use to one discover local businesses in yep. their community, right? I, I, I see it functioning similar to like a Yelp, right? Where people look, where can I go get this type of food? If, if I can go get the local coffee shop, yeah. I want We Lolo to be the place of discovery for local businesses. And whether that's a traveling nurse from St. Luke's or St. Al's, if there's a uh, person that's considering moving into boys and they want to check out the local neighborhood where they may end up you know, buying a home like what local bars restaurants services are in my local area i want we low low to become that vessel but at the same time if you're feeling generous if you want to say support your mailman or you want to do something nice for your son or daughter's teacher i want people to think about using we low low to be that vehicle to make mm-hmm. those things happen um so and again i, I want it to be a place where people actually find their tribe potentially right spark conversation around that right um 
you know, as I think about my transition to Boise, uh, a lot of the friends and relationships I have now were rooted out of a conversation I had over coffee. Mm -hmm. Even meeting, connecting with Mission 43 was done through Teresa McLeod at St. Luke's, mm -hmm. uh, who does community engagement. Her and I met over, over a cup of coffee, right? Yeah. And then she eventually brought me into a meeting uh, a year and a half ago, and that's how I got reintroduced to Mission 43. Yeah. I knew about Mission 43 when I first uh, arrived in Boise six years ago, but I didn't engage until about a year and a half ago. And that was just because I was trying to get uh, situated myself. But so I think ultimately I want We Lolo to be this space. So when we think about local, wanting to support local, wanting to do something generous and kind, or if I want to say thank you to someone, yeah. I want We Lolo to be the first thought that comes into into someone's mind. That's one of the coolest things about it to me because, like, you know, you could always be in the drive through at Starbucks or be at a bar and buy someone a beer. But it's like, hey, the next guy or girl behind me gets, mm -hmm. I'll pay for their tab type of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's happened to me, like, a couple times in my life. And I'm like, damn, and I always want to do it for the person behind me. Mm -hmm. But that's real small scale, right? Mm -hmm. And also, there's some people that I'd really like to thank, like my son's teachers mm -hmm. at their school or the cops that serve this community mm -hmm. or you know, nurses that are mm -hmm. serving this community during, you know, treacherous times. Yeah. Um, but you make that possible because people can actually choose, like, I want to give this to a mm -hmm. veteran or public servant or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you can you can be intentional about where your generosity goes. Again, you can choose one of those demographics um, or you can send it to someone intentionally. As long as you have their phone number or email, you can send it to that individual. Um so yeah, I mean, so that's the the ultimate goal of it, right? Is to create this space where people can, you know, just random acts of kindness, even if yeah. you're not thinking about it, right? You 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 go sit down at one of the local businesses that we partnered with, and you see this this coaster there that says, you "No know, brighten someone's day." You know, there's an opportunity there. You don't have to, but yeah. maybe you know um, th that that opportunity to brighten someone's day goes a long way for that person, right? Especially when it's a random act of kindness. Uh, and again, I think it's, it's really important because we are allowing that money to stay within the local community, right? Why are you so passionate about local? Uh, and has it always been that way or is it something that's developed here? I, I, I want to say the idea of around local, I think naming it local was probably something that was... Uh, happened in, in, in Madison and Wisconsin, right? It's mm. a big support local, eat local, mm -hmm. buy local. But for me growing up in uh, in Georgia, in, 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 in Eastman, I remember there was this store, it was called Four Points. Like it was literally on a four way intersection. And this was the one store in town that everyone went to. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone went there. You can go there, you can get your meat there. It was like a Costco, but on a smaller <laughs> scale, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. It was probably about the size of this office space. It wasn't very big, but you would see friends from school there. You would see people from church. You was, everyone would be there. Mm -hmm. And you had the people in the back, you know, you know drinking their adult beverages. <laughs> but it was a community space. Um, and I used to always look forward to going there just because it, it became an event almost, yeah. in a sense. But I do remember a, a, a pretty big shift um, because we eventually started to get some of the big box stores that would come in. Yep. And, and slowly but surely, over the next maybe year or two, people stopped going to Four Points. They started to go to this other place yep. because it was, a new, it, was, it was kind of a novelty. It was new, right? Places like Atlanta had it, mm -hmm. right? So we yep. want to be like Atlanta, so we're going to yeah. go here and shop. We shopped at whatever that store may be. I don't know if I can say the, the name of the store. Oh, whatever. Yeah, it was Walmart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I noticed that that affected my community so much, right? Um, so I never thought about it as being like local or anything like that. Yeah. It was just, it's what we had. But as I got older and was able to kind of look back in hindsight, I realized that was all local coffee shop. That was all local yeah. bar, brewery, whatever. And so that's why for me, it's like this is where we interact. This is where we meet our friends. This is where we do work. This is where we do life. And I think once you see local businesses start to fade away or not be supported, there's a good chance they're going to be replaced with some other business that may not create that same type of energy yeah. and that money potentially leaves the community right yeah 
Well, I mean, I think Idaho, or certainly in the Treasure Valley here, we have a pretty strong support for local. At least we espouse that. Have you found through We Lolo that you're getting a lot of uh, companies, small shops, local shops mm-hmm. that are on board? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've gotten a lot of good support. Uh, I think the reason We Lolo isn't bigger from a a standpoint of more businesses right now is because I tend to <laughs> one of my good friends who's who's an advisor to me on uh, We Lolo tells me that I tend to over rotate uh-huh. and overcook things right mm. because I, I I want We Lolo to be well received. I want people to enjoy it. I want people to have a good experience mm-hmm. with it. So I tend to overthink even some of the wording and the messaging and all the functions and the buttons and mm-hmm. all the user experience stuff right. Um, so. I've gotten a lot of great response from business owners, um, you know, staff members about it. They love the idea. Um, but I still got to get people to engage with it on a more consistent basis so we can really kind of smooth out all the friction points in it. Um, but, no, I've, I've gotten a lot of great feedback and interaction from business owners. Um, and uh, so, no, it's, 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 it's been good. Again, it goes to that point I made earlier that, how well received I've been here in Boise, uh, and uh, for me to have this idea, to and then for Boise to receive it and let me create space for it has been pretty cool. So, if you had one piece of advice you'd give to a wannabe entrepreneur uh, mm-hmm. that's in our community, what would it be? Uh, do it. Yeah, <laughs> seriously, just just do it. Um, I think sometimes we can think about, is our idea a good idea? It doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, for me, um, and I'm not saying that's going to that's gonna make it easier, but I think there will always be some level of regret if you don't do it, right? I mean, for me, like, I think there's a number, and I, I may have this number off a little bit, but I think like 98, 97, 98% of startups fail, right? So it's kind of like, for me, why not? You know what I mean? It's, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? It's like... like there's a chance that it's going to fail, so why not try it anyway, mm-hmm. right? Um, and if it didn't, if it doesn't work, you know, no one thought it was going to work anyway so well. But for me, I don't want to live with that. One of my biggest fears in life is is having, uh, getting to the end of my life and having a lot of regret. Yep. Right? So that's why I tell people just do it, right? Yep. If it feels right and you've thought it out, you know, and it feels like something, and it makes sense to you, it has to make sense to you. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's about, is it, are these things that I have passion about? Are these things that I will be willing to work on even if it didn't make a dime? And these things, we Lolo is something that if I never made a dime, even if only one business worked, you know, partnered with me, but we were able to pay it forward at that one establishment, yeah. I consider that success, right? So I would tell anyone who's thinking about being an entrepreneur to, to take the plunge, right? Um, and then just kind of, and sign up for Mission 43 if you're a veteran and go through the entrepreneur course. Uh, that'll be helpful. Yeah. Uh, well, for the people that are in the community now, maybe local business owners, like how do they learn more about We Lolo? Uh, we Lolo dot app um, at the uh, at the bottom. If, if sorry, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, there's a contact us uh, button. Um, you can also email me at Malcolm at We Lolo dot app. W e l o l o dot a p p, and that's two L's in Malcolm M a l c o l m. A lot of people leave out that second L in my name. So, well, Malcolm Brown, thank you so much for being here, and thank you what you're continuing to do in serving this country and this community, man. Thanks for being here. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us for the Mission Forty Three podcast. We hope you found it informative and helpful. If you have any questions or feedback, please comment below or email podcast at mission43.org. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast to stay up to date with new episodes. Be proud of your service, not defined by it. See you next time.